All right, let's get started. We are very pleased to welcome Dr. Joyce Lee and Greta Ma, who will teach us about comprehensive Parkinson's care for older adults. Dr. Joyce Lee is a care of the elderly physician who is specialized in the comprehensive assessment and treatment of older adults, especially those with Parkinsonism and dementia. She is the founder and the physician lead of the Geriatrics Clinic for Parkinson's at North York General Hospital, and also one of the co-founders of the Five Weekend Care of the Elderly Certificate course at the University of Toronto. Our second presenter is Greta Ma, who is a geriatric pharmacist at North York General Hospital's Geriatric Clinic for Parkinson's and the Geriatric Day Hospital, as well as coordinator of the Fanny Bernstein Living Well with Parkinson's program. She is an adjunct lecturer at the University of Toronto and a member of the Parkinson Canada's Medical Advisory Council. Before we start the presentation, I'd like to let you know that our presenters will answer questions at the end, but please feel free to post your questions in the chat box at any time. And with that, I'd like to invite Joyce and Greta to take the stage, and I'll have them share their screen with you. Good afternoon. Thanks for inviting me and Dr. Lee to share about a new approach, comprehensive care for Parkinson's disease. Here's our disclosure. And since we can't really see our audience, it would be nice to know who is attending our webinar today. And I know Wendy has prepared a poll for all of us. I'll start our presentation with some latest data and healthcare utilization of Parkinson's disease. And then Dr. Lee will illustrate the complexity of the disease with a case scenario and explore the model of comprehensive care. I'll come back to share our experience in preventing hospitalization. When I first learned about Parkinson's disease, I thought of someone young like Michael J. Fox, but later I realized majority of people with Parkinson's are seniors. According to JAMA Neurology, published earlier this year, PD is the fastest growing neurological disease, even surpassing Alzheimer's. And based on our government's report, the number of people with PD will double in just a little over 10 years. Are we ready? And based on the Ontario report in 2015, the healthcare cost for one elderly patient per year is over $20,000, and a significant portion is from the healthcare, the hospital care. Data from the National Parkinson Foundation, Movement Disorder Centers of Excellence, one third of the patients with PD reported at least one eMERGE visit or hospitalization. In their one-year follow-up, they found half of these patients were readmitted. Other studies found people with PD are not just hospitalized more frequently, but also have longer lengths of stay. Main reasons are PD psychosis and dementia, non-physical symptoms such as dizziness and falls, severe constipation, dysphagia leading to aspiration pneumonia, bladder problems leading to UTI, depression, panic attack, uh, motor complications such as end of those wearing off, freezing of gait at more uh, advanced disease stage. We also found older age, higher number of medications, comorbidities, and caregiver stress are the key risk factors for hospital readmission. Caregiver stress increased as patients suffer more disability, especially from mood disorders, psychosis, dementia, and frequent fall. All these findings are quite surprising to many people as we tend to think of PD as just a condition with a little shaking and slow movement. So now I'll let Dr. Lee explain why Parkinson's is such a complex condition and what some of the treatment challenges are. Thank you, Greta. So now we're gonna move on to talk about the pathophysiology of idiopathic Parkinson's disease. As most of you probably already know, Parkinson's disease results from the progressive degeneration of the dopaminergic neurons in substantia nigra, which is a part of the basal ganglia. And with the degeneration of these neurons, um, typically when the motor symptoms appear, there are already 70 to 80% of the neurons that have already degenerated. And with that, we get what we typically think of as um, the trap symptoms. That includes tremor, stiffness, 
akinesia or bradykinesia, which is basically slowness, and postural imbalance. Primarily in the early stages of Parkinson's, we are dealing with the tremor, stiffness, and slowness, whereas in the more advanced stages, people start developing um, gait disorders uh, and postural imbalance. And in advanced stages, we see freezing of gait. This can be present in 50 to 90% of patients by 15 years. And with that, of course, frequent falls occur. And here's a video of freezing of gait, if you've never seen that before. So this patient is in the off phase. What we mean by off phase is um, when patients take levodopa, which is the gold standard treatment to overcome the dopaminergic deficit in Parkinson's disease, they typically experience an on phase and an off phase. The, the uh, on phase occurs when the patient has absorbed the medication and the medication is working optimally. And the off phase happens at the end of the dosing interval. What happens with freezing of gait is that unfortunately, as the disease progresses, um, patients start to experience more and more trouble with this because of various issues such as anxiety, attentional deficit, cognitive deficit, and so forth. It is to the degree that um, even when they're in the on stage, um, they can still have freezing of gait when they're going through doorways or nearing a destination such as a chair. We'll just do a quick review of the medications for motor symptoms. As I mentioned, uh, Parkinson's disease results from dopaminergic deficit in the brain, and therefore levodopa is the mainstay of treatment because levodopa is converted to dopamine in the brain. Now, there are other medications that can be adjunctive to levodopa. Antacabone, for example, is a COM-T inhibitor, and this prolongs levodopa benefit. MAOB inhibitors, um, such as risagiline, will also prolong the dopamine benefit of levodopa. Dopamine agonists, such as primipexol, which you may know by the name of Mirapex, ropinerol, and roticotine, those mimic dopamine. So they're not really dopamine, but they are uh, simply agonists um, and stimulate the dopamine receptors. These are, uh, for the most part, not really used in older patients or should not be used in older patients because of the side effects. Anticholinergic, such as trihexyphenidol and benztropine, um, are quite effective for tremor, but because of the anticholinergic side effects, they are really quite rarely used. Amantadine, which is in its own class, is primarily indicated these days for dyskinesia, which is the involuntary movements that occur primarily in the on state of being on levodopa. Now, the Canadian Guidelines on Parkinson's Disease um, has, uh, has uh, uh, the hierarchy and the protocol for using these medications, and I will refer you to that uh, document, which was just on the previous screen. Now, in this picture, what we see is that what we think of as Parkinsonism, which is really just the motor symptoms of slowness, stiffness, posture instability, and tremor, are really only the tip of the iceberg. And below that, we see that there's a huge number of other areas of the body that are affected. And with these areas affected, we have all the non-motor symptoms such as cognition, personality change, pain, fatigue, sensory symptoms, sleep problems, and behavioral problems. As you can see in this picture, the Lewy bodies, which um, are the underlying pathophysiological uh, protein um, issue in Parkinson's disease not only accumulates in the substantia nigra, it actually accumulates in many different parts of the nervous system. It even accumulates in the peripheral nervous system, giving rise to the autonomic features, and in the cortex, which gives rise to things like visual hallucinations, cognitive impairment, as well as sleep disorders. So then we can see that TRAP is really only part of the picture of Parkinson's disease. All the non-motor symptoms, um, such as depression, anxiety, constipation, and REM sleep disorder, which is when patients kick and scream when they're dreaming, these symptoms can actually often be present even prior to the motor diagnosis. And with time, uh, as the disease progresses, patients often will experience other non-motor features, such, such as pain, speech difficulty, 
frequent urination, up to 33% of patients will have overactive bladder, and as well as dizziness and autonomic dysfunction leading to um, postural hypotension. This is um, a non-motor uh, screening questionnaire that we often use in our clinic to screen for these non-motor features. Um, non-motor symptoms have really become um, sort of uh, come to the forefront of Parkinson's disease research in the past 10 years because people are recognizing that the non-motor features are actually even more important than the motor features in terms of affecting patients' quality of life, especially in the later stages of the disease. So I have created a little diagram here. For me, comprehensive Parkinson's assessment um, includes really three, three facets. So you can think of it as a triangle. We've got the motor symptoms, which would include the trap symptoms, of course, motor fluctuations and complications such as um, falls and um, dyskinesias and so forth. And um, osteoporosis is also under here because Parkinson's patients also have a higher risk for osteoporosis. And then we've got neuropsychiatric symptoms, which includes depression, anxiety, psychosis, dementia, and sleep disorders, and all the autonomic features, which include GI symptoms, uh, hypotension, urinary symptoms, pain syndromes, dysphagia, and drooling. And it's important to recognize that each patient may experience different non-motor symptoms at different stages. So treatment really has to be very individualized. Now, I'll present a case to you about this gentleman named Jay. He's a 72-year-old retired artist. He lives with his wife. He's had Parkinson's for five years, and recently, he's had multiple unexplained falls. He fell five times in a month and went to emerge three times for these falls. He's been complaining of postural dizziness, some blurred vision at times, and difficulty in concentrating and thinking. And he notes, he's noticed that these particularly happen when he is in the on state or when he stands up quickly or after a big meal. So when we measure his blood pressure, we notice that there's a significant postural drop from sitting to standing. Now in Parkinson's disease, there is often pronounced blood pressure variability. The definition of orthostatic hypotension is, is a drop in systolic blood pressure of over 20 millimeters mercury or the diastolic blood pressure by 10 millimeters mercury within three minutes of going from sitting to standing. And in, when, in people without autonomic dysfunction, the normal circadian rhythm of blood pressure is that your blood pressure should dip during sleeping. In these patients with autonomic dysfunction, we see that during the day, their blood pressure can be quite low. And in particular, um, when, um, when they stand up, it can drop significantly, leading to issues of presyncope and syncope. Whereas at night, when they're lying down, there is significant hypertension. And when we look at orthostatic hypotension, of course, the first thing we have to look at is, um, other than hydration status, is all the other medications uh, that the patient is on. We have to think about what medications can be exacerbating this problem. And these can include alcohol, alpha blockers for uh, BPH, such as Flomax, anti-Parkinson's medications, including levodopa, all the dopamine agonists, and even MAOB inhibitors. Of course, blood pressure medications, antidepressants such as tricyclic antidepressants like amitriptyline and nortriptyline. Antipsychotics are also implicated as well as the newer diabetes medication. So what's the difference between orthostatic hypotension due to autonomic dysfunction compared to someone who just has orthostatic hy uh, hypotension because of medication or dehydration? The main difference is in autonomic dysfunction, there's a lack of the normal compensatory autonomic response to a drop in blood pressure, which is heart rate increase. So in patients who are just dehydrated, when the blood pressure drops, you see that the heart rate goes up to try and compensate for this. However, in patients with autonomic dysfunction, the heart rate does not go up. And these features often coexist with other uh, dysautonomia, such as severe constipation, urinary issues, and so forth. And the treatment goal in this case is to reduce symptoms, prevent falls, and improve the person's function. So let's go through the non-pharmacological management first. First, the patients have to understand what 
what orthostatic hypotension is and what are the triggers for it. The triggers typically include big meals, forceful defecation, so treatment of constipation is very important, dehydration, and heat. And they need to understand what are the symptoms of uh, orthostatic hypotension. And we also ask them to monitor their postural blood pressures at home and report to us. The strategies mainly include either increasing blood volume and decreasing venous pooling. So in order to increase blood volume, we advise obviously increased fluid intake, you know, five to eight, eight ounce glasses of fluids per day, as well as increasing salt intake if there's no cardiovascular contraindication. Typically, it is easy for patients to drink one to two cups of V8 or full, full salt uh, chicken broth um, every day, and um, that usually does the trick for some of the milder patients. And uh, elevation of legs when they're sitting, compression stockings and abdominal binders can also work, but the compliance is variable in these cases. Raising the head of the bed by four inches to decrease nocturia and supine hypertension has also been recommended. In terms of the medications that can be used for treatment of orthostatic hypotension, after we have corrected the correctable factors, um, and if the issue is still persistent, include mitodrine, which is uh, an alpha agonist, which is a vasoconstrictor. And mitodrine uh, is taken typically three times a day uh, when the patient first, first gets up and then every three to four hours after that uh, at around noontime and 3.30 p.m. And this medication only really lasts about three hours. Um, it is important for the patients to realize that they can't lie down for three to four hours after each dose of mitodrine because it can cause significant supine hypertension. And the other option is fludrocortisone, which is basically a mineralocorticoid. Um, this increases the blood volume by retaining salt and fluid. This is contraindic contraindicated in patients with renal failure and heart failure. And we've also learned this trick over time, that because patients often um, have severe orthostatic hypotension during the day, requiring medications like mitodrine, um, but at the same time, they may have a significant supine hypertension with systolic blood pressures going up to 180 at night. We often prescribe a short-acting blood pressure medication, such as Captopril, at bedtime for them. And in those cases, I would advise against using fludrocortisone, because fludrocortisone obviously is indiscriminate in terms of um, increasing the blood pressure uh, between day and night. Pyridostigmine is also another medication that can be tried. It is a modest vasoconstrictor, but the good thing about this is that it doesn't cause supine hypertension. However, the side effects, including basically they're all cholinergic side effects, such as diarrhea, abdominal colic, nausea, and drooling can be dose limiting. So for Jay, let's look at his medication list. He's on Rosagiline, Stilevo, which is a combination of levodopa, carbidopa, and antacapone, and cinema CR as, as well as tamsulosin. So first, we can decrease the tamsulosin to 0.4 milligrams. And we also can consider reducing risagiline to 0.5 milligrams daily, um, hopefully without compensate, decompensating uh, Jay's motor symptoms before we consider adding mitodrine to his regimen. And now we move on to other non-motor features. Depression, anxiety, psychosis, dementia, sleep problems, dysphagia, and aspiration pneumonia. And these non-motor symptoms can be particularly uh, problematic in the later stages of Parkinson's disease, affecting the patient's quality of life even more than their trap symptoms. Five years later, Jay was admitted to hospital. In this case, he came to hospital because his minor and benign hallucinations became very disturbing and scary over the last couple of months. He was trying to run away from these hallucinations and he froze and fell down.
Okay, sorry guys, I think the audio is not working, right? So let's start this again. Okay. Oops. Why is there no audio? That's so weird. I'm Diane Sogan. Um, I live with my husband, Jay, who has Parkinson's disease. We met at art school in San Francisco many years ago. We've been married 51 years and have a beautiful daughter named Kari. And we've had a wonderful life together to this point. We have a lot of challenges, but we're quite happy. We moved into this house in 2009 and after a little while I began noticing he would talk about seeing things on the periphery of his vision. He began seeing black cats and they would kind of run past him. At that point we thought, oh my gosh, what is going on? When Jay began having hallucinations and delusions, we went to his neurologist and explained what was going on. And he explained to us that this is an aspect of Parkinson's disease psychosis. There are so many things that go along with them. Definitely there's a paranoia. He gets worried that somebody's accessing our money through the computer. That's not me. He also doesn't believe that I'm me very often. He will walk up to me and say, where's Diane? And he will say, can you please call Diane and let her know I want to talk to her. And so I'll call myself and he'll talk to me. And, um, strangely, we can have fun with that. It's not all bleak. But it's kind of scary. You just wonder how far it will go. Day-to-day -day life has changed immensely. The physical things with the Parkinson's and easier to deal with than the psychosis. Both were forced to retire and I basically need to be with him 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I took all the meals. He did have to quit driving. I now handle all the finances. I pretty much do in both of our lives. Yeah, I do miss the way things were, but we do the best we can with what it is. So we can see how um, psychosis and Parkinson's disease really can take a toll on the patient and the caregiver. And it is so much more disabling um, in comparison to even the motor symptoms. So the approach to Parkinson's disease psychosis. Um, psychosis uh, becomes more uh, common um, with the progression of disease. And um, in Jay's case, when he's coming in with this seemingly relatively acute situation, um, we of course need to rule out potential causes of delirium, such as an acute illness, infection, um, something that a lot of people don't think about is constipation and fecal impaction. It is, I have to say, in about 90% of cases of Parkinson's patients that present to hospital, I find significant fecal impaction. Um, and this, this is multifactorial because of the fact that they often have urinary symptoms, they don't drink enough fluids, um, they often stop their uh, bowel routine because they um, you know, don't understand that they have to take it all the time, and they're often quite sedentary. And with that, people often also get urinary retention. And I would say that in these patients, uh, probably one of the top causes of urinary retention is fecal impaction. And other things such as metabolic, drugs, head injury from the falls, et cetera, can also be causes of delirium and, and psychosis. Now, the next is to look at the medication review. Can any medication, in this case, be contributing to the psychosis? And lastly, um, we need to gather a very good history and do a good assessment with regards to, is the patient developing Parkinson's disease dementia? Now, the main thing that I want to point out is that when someone presents with PD psychosis, antipsychotics should not be a knee-jerk response. And um, so in terms of how we uh, look at the medication review, obviously we need to minimize the common culprits. 
such as anticholinergics, benzodiazepines, opioids, etc. However, next we need to look at Parkinson's medications. Because all Parkinson's medications um, can potentially worsen psychosis, it is important to recognize and to understand which ones we need to decrease or stop first without hopefully worsening the motor symptoms. First, um, I would say try and stop any anticholinergics and taper down amantadine. The next one on the list would be taper down dopamine agonists. I have to emphasize that we must taper down dopamine agonists and amantadine because people can experience withdrawal effects, particularly with dopamine agonists. And we can decrease or stop risagiline, selegiline, or entacapone. And last resort is to touch the levodopa. And one key to look at whether you can actually um, afford to decrease the dopaminergic medications is to look at their motor function. And in our assessments, we always assess both the non-motor and the motor features um, in order to sort of reach a very balanced um, approach to it. And with these decreases, of course, we need to monitor for worsening of motor symptoms. So next we'll talk a bit about Parkinson's disease dementia. Whenever someone presents with PD psychosis, we must remember that we can't just say, well, it's just the medication causing psychosis. Let's just put you on some quetiapine. It is important to, to say, well, let's, let's look at the situation. Has there been a functional decline? How long has this been going on? And do a proper cognitive assessment to see if the patient may be developing Parkinson's disease dementia. Because we know that by year four or five, um, about 50% of patients start having issues with their cognition. And by year eight to 10, uh, depending on the source of the, the data, about 80% of patients can have Parkinson's disease dementia. The first line of treatment is not antipsychotic, is actually cholinesterase inhibitors such as donepezil and rivastigmine. And we, can, we must use antipsychotics such as quetiapine very judiciously because of the adverse effects of prolonging QT, increasing the risk of stroke and death, as well as constipation, hypotension, and falls. So in terms of antipsychotic agents, which agents can we use? Really, the only agents that are considered to be safe in Parkinson's are quetiapine and clozapine. Quetiapine is the first choice because it doesn't have the, um, the adverse effects of agranulocytosis, which is um, a very serious but rare adverse effect in clozapine. And clozapine also requires routine CBC. Initially, it is weekly CBC. So obviously, we don't use that as first line. Um, we avoid all the other antipsychotics. And note that even risperidone and olanzapine and eripiprazole are on this list. Even though these are considered to be atypical antipsychotics, in higher doses, these can still cause extra pyramidal symptoms. So in Jay's case, we do a cognitive assessment. We notice that his MOCA is 17 over 30. And I would like, like to point out that he was mainly impaired in the executive, visual, spatial function, as well as having issues with attention and fluctuations in his cognition and level of consciousness. And these features are much more prominent in Parkinson's disease dementia compared to Alzheimer's dementia where memory is the main deficit. So when we look at his medications, um, we can consider discontinuation of risagiline because that will reduce the dopaminergic um, load in his body and reduce the psychosis. If his motor symptoms are okay, especially if the patient is having dyskinesias, which tell you that he's probably a little bit overtreated, um, we can also consider gradually discontinuation of antacapone. So what, how you do this is by switching to levo, dose by dose back to just levocarb, and that would decrease the dopaminergic equivalent by about 20%. And in addition, for those very troublesome symptoms, which are distressing to the patient or dangerous, um, we can use quetiapine on a PRN basis. And remember for quetiapine prescription, if the patient is gonna uh, use quetiapine regularly, he, they must be on a bowel routine. 
Donepazil, uh, 5 milligrams daily, or rivastigmine, 1.5 milligrams daily, can be considered as well if there are no cardiovascular or other contraindications. Now, remember that donepazil, 5 milligrams daily, is already the ther a therapeutic dose, whereas rivastigmine, 1.5 BID, is not a therapeutic dose. The lowest therapeutic dose is 3 milligrams BID. Now, when patients like Jay get hospitalized, there are many ill consequences. We know that patients with Parkinson's, when they're in hospital, there's often a poor adherence to Parkinson's disease medication schedule. Oftentimes, people get prescribed contraindicated medications like Haldol, or even things like Stematil or uh, Propylperazine, metoclopramide, for whatever reason. Uh, they often get immobilized um, for long periods of time, uh, and they develop very often delirium. And we know that older patients with Parkinson's disease versus non-Parkinson's disease have longer length of stay, more functional decline due to hospitalization, and higher admission to long-term care after hospitaliza hospitalization. And currently, unfortunately, there are no hospital PD management guidelines. So now I have talked to you about all the complexity of Parkinson's disease and all the things that can happen in uh, advanced Parkinson's disease is it time to rethink of PD in the elderly as a geriatric syndrome? If we look at the definition of geriatric syndrome, we see that patients have shared risk factors such as increasing age, cognitive impairment, functional impairment, and mobility impairment. And these give rise to what we, call, what we think of as geriatric syndromes, such as falls, pressure ulcers, delirium functional decline incontinence, and a frailty, and, it, and on it goes in terms of the vicious uh, circle, leading to poor, health outcomes, including disability, dependence, institutionalization, and death. When we look at Parkinson's, we see that we have many motor symptoms, falls, functional decline. We have non-motor symptoms with a cognitive decline and many other non-motor features. In addition, elderly patients tend to have a lot of comorbidities that also increase their frailty. And they have polypharmacy, which increases the risk of drug-drug, drug-disease interactions and adverse effects. So really, we should start thinking of Parkinson's disease, not just as Parkinson's disease, but really it is a new geriatric syndrome. And this is in fact supported by literature. Um, this, uh, this group um, in Italy has talked about Parkinson's disease in the elderly as an example of geriatric syndrome. And British Geriatric Society has long taken um, the lead um, on this in terms of the geriatrics world by saying that management of Parkinson's disease in elderly patients is very challenging. And it really recommends um, a full geriatric assessment by specialists in geriatric medicine. And they also recommend comprehensive service, including outpatient clinics, day hospital, and so forth. And in fact, British Geriatric Society has run PD Academy since 2002, and they have run nine formal master classes for geriatricians already. In the ninth 2017 guidelines, which is the UK guidelines, um, they indicate that specialists providing care for PD include geriatricians and neurologists supported by an interprofessional team. The Canadian guidelines on PD in 2012 also support the idea that PD care should be comprehensive, holistic, and supported by an interprofessional team and with a key clinician point of contact to support patients and caregivers. So now let's look at what is going on in Canada and really North America right now in terms of Parkinson's care. You see, when the patient has Parkinson's disease, usually they will go to a family doctor, they'll get a referral to a neurologist or movement disorder specialist, and currently, we have just heard that uh, the wait list at, at Toronto Western can be up to three years, which obviously is unacceptable for these patients. And if they have any psychosis, depression, um, or other issues, they often get referred to a psychiatrist, and they also have to go to other specialists for their other comorbidities, and maybe go to a urologist for their urinary symptoms. And you see that specialists often are working in silos, which results in significantly fragmented care. And there is often a lack of an interprofessional team approach or a sort of comprehensive holistic approach to help these patients. And this presents a very big problem for the caregiver who already is suffering from a lot of caregiver stress. They don't know who to call when something happens. So we saw this problem and we started this idea of comprehensive Parkinson's care at Northrop General Hospital. We started the clinic in 2007 
And along with the clinic, um, we are supported by the Fanny Bernstein Living Well with Parkinson's Exercise and Education Program, as well as our Geriatric State Hospital. And with that, I'll, I'll pass this on to Greta. So as we are aware how complex Parkinson's disease management could be, and also each patient goes through different stages. So we're really thankful that at North York General, we have three different services to meet all their needs at different stages. Most of our inter uh, interprofessional team members have received training from the National Parkinson Foundation. Our physiotherapist was also certified with the POWER program to provide specialized Parkinson exercise and movement strategy. As the pharmacist for all three services, all three services, I get to know the patients very well. So I have to show these cheesy pictures as our team was so thrilled to receive the Commitment to Care and Service Award for Excellent Collaborative Parkinson Care back in 2011. Our Fanny Bernstein Living Well Parkinson's is designed for patients at early stage of the disease to receive an individual consultation by the pharmacist and physiotherapist, followed by the eight weekly group education and exercise program run by the interprofessional team. Our goal is to empower patients and caregivers to take an active role in the disease management by learning about the treatment and how to recognize different motor and non-motor symptoms. We also have our past alumni to share their own successful journey to instill hope. We also provide exercise and movement strategies to improve their function, prevent falls, and delay disease progression. Our geriatric day hospital is suitable for elderly patients struggling with more advanced Parkinson's disease. They receive individual guidance to adjust the medications to improve gait and balance, as well as skills for self-care and support for care partners. As Dr. Lee mentioned, our geriatric clinic for Parkinson's um, started back in 2007 and we have seen over a thousand patients, and we provide comprehensive assessment and management of Parkinson's. And we're glad that uh, recently one of our neurologists and our nurse have recently joined us to expand our service. In light of the high hospitalization and eMERGE visit by the elderly patients uh, with Parkinson's, we want to know if our comprehensive care can prevent hospital utilization. So we conducted a prospective observational study to evaluate whether the clinic pharmacist provides case management by telephone intervention with physician support can adverse eMERGE visit. We also want to find out the reason for the cause and also caller satisfaction of our service. So all calls received in 2016 were follow-up follow up and analyzed. The call was designated as crisis call when the caller indicated intention to go to eMERGE if issues were not resolved. So in one year, we have received 3,037 calls from over 100 patients. Most of the calls were from patients' elderly spouses. There were more male than female patients with average age of 80 years old, and half of our patients were diagnosed with dementia, and more than half also struggled with depression and anxiety. Average duration of Parkinson's was about nine years, and we had patients suffering from PD for uh, close to 29 years. About one in every four calls were designated as crisis calls when the caller indicated intention to go to eMERGE if the issues were not resolved. So we're quite um, impressed by the, the number of crisis calls that we encounter. Over 40% of the calls were due to non-motor symptoms, such as psychosis, low blood pressure, pain, severe mood, and sleep problems. And about 30% of calls were related to medication side effects such as acute confusion for, from certain medication uh, for Parkinson's and bladder um, management, dizziness or severe nausea from dementia treatment, hypersexuality and impulsive behavior from certain Parkinson's drugs. 
and some patients um, even suffer from uh, drowsiness, from muscle relaxants, or worsening of hypotension that require adjustment of the usual blood pressure medication. We also come across one case, uh, the wife reported that patient couldn't eat due to bruxism from uh, paroxetine. And we often get calls from uh, patient and family uh, when they um, come across motor fluctuation. And they uh, sometimes complain that like, the medication is not working fast enough to control the PD or the drug takes a long time to work. And sometimes they suffer from severe involuntary movement or pain from dystonia. So all these need to be adjusted um, uh, of the medication. And there's a few cases of drug interaction led to drowsiness or serotonin syndrome. So quick referral uh, were made for palliative care and wound care uh, to prevent some of the eMERGE visits. And this one palliative patient experienced muscle pain when he couldn't take any of uh, Parkinson's drug by mouth at that stage. Um, so the PN, um, uh, at, uh, sorry, the NP at the other end, uh, trying to find out how to provide uh, lethal dopa by rectal route to allow the patient to stay home and uh, uh, get some uh, comfort measure. So of the 82 crisis calls, only six uh, patients require hospitalization. Two were due to falls, and the rest were due to uh, different medical conditions, such as dehydration with delirium, uh, septicemia, uh, severe anxiety with insomnia, and end-stage uh, CHF. So as you notice, the crisis calls were not necessarily related to Parkinson's, um, but <clears throat> patients would call us and to know what's going on and should I go to eMERGE. So these cases, they were directed to go to eMERGE right away. So our elderly patient and caregiver um, really feel um, support like through uh, this quick intervention. So this demonstrates their confidence in our comprehensive Parkinson care um, and our established strong therapeutic relationship. So based on our anonymous survey, 97% of patients uh, express uh, they're highly satisfied with our service with 92% uh, of uh, high confidence. Now I'll pass the time back to Dr. Lee. So, um, as you can see, uh, we were able to prevent hospitalization, uh, which is obviously a very undesirable thing in Parkinson's patients, in particular in very frail elderly Parkinson's patients. Um, I think there are several key success factors of our model. Um, comprehensive approach to the assessment and management of non-motor and motor symptoms, I think, is key. It is uh, difficult to really um, improve uh, the overall outcomes and quality of life of a patient if uh, you're dealing with the the symptoms in a piecemeal fashion, in a fragmented fashion. Because as you can see, when someone, for example, has psychosis, um, you often have to adjust the motor, the motor um, medications, the Parkinson's medications, in order to, um, to help them uh, get better. And it is important to discuss also the goals um, of care, uh, you know, when the, when the patients start having issues such as psychosis in the more advanced stages. Um, and most families, in my experience, um, all prefer um, to have more mental clarity compared to uh, being on all the time. And so, with, um, so in order to provide this sort of comprehensive management and assessment, um, the physician really needs competence in both geriatrics and management of Parkinson's. And in my case, I was fortunate that I was able to work with an excellent movement disorders neurologist at Toronto Western Hospital, Dr. Miyasaki, for six years. And for six years, I went down to work with her and learned all about Parkinson's disease. And so therefore, I combined it with my background in uh, care of the elderly and as well as my previous background as a pharmacist. And I think the third piece is that um, um, the clinician-driven case management is really important. Case management is sort of a buzzword that's been thrown around quite a bit in recent years in various circles, but case management really only works um, when it is done by a clinician who has a therapeutic relationship and expertise um, on, on the case. Um, and in this case, because Greta is that person who has a therapeutic relationship, um, to the degree that, you know, we're so trusted that they'll call us for even non-PD related things, um, 
that I think that is why uh, that this model works so well. So in summary, we have presented today to you um, almost a paradigm shift that Parkinson's in the elderly is really a complex geriatric syndrome. It should not be sort of uh, divided into the realm of only neurologists looking after Parkinson's patients. Geriatricians and care of the elderly physicians are also um, in prime position if we obtain more training in Parkinson's disease in order to look after these patients in a comprehensive manner. And we've presented to you also that our comprehensive Parkinson's care model with clinician case management was able to avert 93% of potential ED visits and hospitalizations in this very frail elderly Parkinson's disease um, patient population. With an average age of 80, at least 50% had dementia and 50 to 60% had anxiety and depression and a duration of Parkinson's disease of nine years. And so how do we replicate this, this kind of model? How do we spread the model? These are, I think, the requirements. Geriatricians and care of the elderly physicians can be trained in Parkinson's disease care. And um, this can occur in various manners, including uh, a clinical mentorship uh, and so forth like I did. Um, elder care pharmacists or nurse um, needs to be also on the team and needs to be trained in Parkinson's disease care like Greta is. And we also need the existing Jewish Day Hospital or perhaps Parkinson's education and exercise team to support the care. And our day hospital staff are certified in National Parkinson uh, Foundation uh, team education as well as in the POWER program. And of course, with all this, it is important to present this kind of model to um, people that make decisions, uh, such as the ministry and, um, and Central Lynn, um, to obtain their funding and commitment. And um, I didn't put that slide in here today, but I'd just like to mention that in a separate presentation previously, um, we have done a calculation that in the Central Lynn, we, um, we estimate that there are about 7,500 people with Parkinson's disease. And if we assume that about one out of three patients are admitted to hospital per year with 50% readmitted, we're dealing with uh, about 3,700 admissions expected per year. If we assume that this kind of model can be replicated to deal with these, to care for these patients, um, then uh, we're looking at a reduction of um, potentially more uh, about 2,000 admissions per year that can be prevented if we assume that the model only works uh, to prevent 50%, um, you know, conservatively, uh, the hospitalizations. And if we assume that um, uh, these patients do stay quite a long time, maybe seven to 21 days length of stay, which is conservative, and we multiply this out, we're looking at a potential 13 million to 39 million just in central Lynn alone of healthcare savings. And, um, and so with this, I'd like to open up uh, for any questions and I'm gonna um, look at the chat box. Okay, there's no chat box, there it is. Okay. This is the last slide. Oh yeah, okay, sorry. Okay. And these are further resources that uh, Greta has put together. Um, and in order to reach us, um, this is, you can go to our website. Thank you very much. And I'm just gonna go to the questions now. So um, Marilyn said us, uh, does the education component with the education exercise program include family and caregiver education? Yes, it does. Family and caregivers are always invited to these sessions. Um, and um, also, they often do also come to Geriatric Day Hospital as well, um, because we have a social worker um, who can also do some caregiver support counseling. And the other question is, are you utilizing geriatric outreach teams in this model? Um, yes, we are. Um, we do have a geriatric outreach team. Um, we, we, do, we are sort of an integrated um, uh, specialized geriatric service here at North York. So um, whoever cannot come out to the, to the clinic, we do send in the outreach uh, physician or clinician to make sure that they are safe at home. 
And does Parkinson's disease dementia differ in signs and symptoms from other types of dementia? Yes, absolutely. Um, so Parkinson's disease dementia, um, uh, really, uh, the diagnostic criteria are quite different. So the main, the main issues in Parkinson's disease dementia would be executive dysfunction, um, visual hallucinations, and fluctuations. As opposed to an Alzheimer's dementia, it is primarily memory. I have been told that people with Parkinson's should not get the flu shot. Is this accurate? No. <laughs> no. So we encourage people to type in their questions in the chat box and uh, Dr. Lee and Greta will answer them as time permits. We've got a few more minutes to answer questions. That was a very enlightening presentation. Um, one question I had for the both of you is what were your hours that you had for the crisis call line? So the, uh, basically we encourage them to call us as soon as they notice something unusual. Yeah. So don't wait till like the problem, don't wait till the problems like get yeah. severe. So, um, so our hours is the typical Monday to Friday, um, 8.30 to 4.30. Yeah, so even with psychosis or hallucination, it doesn't happen suddenly. They usually like gradually they see shadow and then become something more severe. So um, they were informed to call us as soon as they noticed something unusual. But of course, like on Saturday, Sunday, they will still have to go to emerge if um, crisis that occur. Okay, so we have a couple more questions. Do you take referrals from other hospitals? Um, Yes, but we do have a long wait list right now. Um, can you please repeat what you just said with regards to the difference between early dementia signs and AD versus PDD? So um, in AD, it's primarily short-term memory, and people are not going to have fluctuations in their attention or cognition. Um, they're not going to have visual, vivid visual hallucinations. And one of the main things that just uh, sort of got added to... Um, to the diagnostic criteria of Lewy body dementia, which is really related to Parkinson's dementia, is that REM sleep disorder has become a core feature. So REM sleep disorder is basically uh, when patients are asleep, they're dreaming, and their muscles are not paralyzed, so they're acting out their dreams. So they may scream, they may yell, they may kick, they may punch. Um, the presence of dementia, which is um, basically a decline in cognitive function to the degree that it is affecting uh, the person's um, function, day-to-day uh, -day function. Um, uh, the combination of dementia and REM sleep disorder is basically already pointing towards a diagnosis of a Lewy body type dementia or Parkinson's type dementia. Is there an emphasis with your attrition group to obtain the enhanced education for PD? So, um, so currently in Canada, we don't have that sort of enhanced, like a, like a um, systematized enhanced PD education right now, unlike the in, in Britain. And uh, that's something that I'm working on. And um, I think part of, uh, part of our, our hope and dream in running this program is that we can inspire people to go into this field. I'm always happy to chat with um, um, trainees and geriatricians and care of the elderly physicians uh, who are interested in this field and I'm always happy to mentor them. And I'm, I'm hoping to start a comprehensive Parkinson's care course with some of the other experts in the field across the country. So hopefully that will materialize soon and then we can have sort of a certificate course for um, the geriatricians and care of the elderly physicians and anybody else who is interested. Okay, great. It looks like uh, we're out of questions there and we're coming up to the top of the hour. So I want to say thank, thank you, you very much again to our presenters, Dr. Joyce Lee and Greta Ma, for this very um, engaging and great learning opportunity. Thank you to, to our attendees and we encourage you to take a few minutes to complete the quick survey that will be emailed to you. And just a note that we'd like to invite everyone to join us for our next webinar on January 25th from 12 to 1 on urinary incontinence, the neglected geriatric syndrome with Dr. Martha Spencer from Providence Healthcare in BC and registration for the webinar and more information will be emailed soon. Thanks again and see you next time. We're signing off now.